Good morning, everybody. As you find a seat, worship with these families as we dedicate these beautiful babies. Mackenzie Aguano, Jose and Erica. Mackenzie. Mackenzie. Father, we dedicate Mackenzie to you. We thank you for this beautiful little baby girl. We consecrate and lift her up to you and ask you to bless her, put your favor, put your touch on her, protection, your angels around her, and keep her by your power. Keep her always near the cross. Bless this family. We thank you for this life. Now use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Praise God. Hayden Claire Crumley. Her parents, Ben and Trista Crumley. Hayden, yes, sir. Hayden. Yes. And families, feel free to lay hands with me if you'd like. Hayden. Hayden, yes, sir. Lord, we thank you for Hayden. And we lay our hands on her and we bless her in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Touch her, Lord, and keep her by your power. We dedicate her to you in this altar today. We know there's gifts and there's a plan for her life. <laughs> So use her for your glory. Keep her by your protection. And we thank you for her. Thank you for this life. Bless her and bless this family. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Bless you. You're welcome. Beautiful. Bless you. Hey. Hi. Liam James Colhane. His parents, Chad and Deanna Liam. Colhane. Liam. Liam. Lord, I thank you for Liam. And we dedicate him to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bless and keep him. Make your face shine on him. Be gracious unto him. Lift up your countenance upon him. Give him peace. Lord, we just pray your will be done in his life. Let him always serve you. Always be near your heart. We thank you for it. Keep him by your power. Bless this home. In Jesus' name. Amen. That's cute. Trenton Daniel Reed. His parents, Landon and Tabitha Reed. What's his first name? Trenton. Trenton. Lord, we thank you for Trenton. And we dedicate him to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bless him and keep him. Make your face shine on him. Be gracious unto him. Lift up your countenance upon him. Give him peace. Make him a mighty man, Lord, for you. Give him strength. Give him talents, give him gifts, and give him leadership, and let him lead. We thank you for it, Lord. Keep him by your power. Bless this home with your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, sir. Bless you. Daniela Geraldo Restrepo. Her parents, Esteban and Claudia. Dan Daniela. Lord, I thank you for Daniela. And I dedicate her to you in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. I pray your favor upon this little girl. I pray your blessing, your protection, your keeping power. Let goodness and mercy follow her all the days of her life. Keep her by your power and keep her in the house of the Lord forever. We thank you for it. Bless this home in Jesus' name. Amen. Rory Palmer Wellborn. His parents, Ishmael and Chelsea Wellborn. What's his first name? Rory. Rory. Lord, we thank you for Rory. We dedicate him to you in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Bless and keep him. Make your face shine on him. Be gracious unto him. Keep him by your power. Do great and mighty things in his life. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, I stir up the gift that is within him through the laying on of hands. Keep him by your power and bless him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, are they twins? No. 19 months apart. 19 months apart. I'll see you in a few months. God bless you. <laughs> oh, man, you, buddy. Good to see you. Grace, Grace Wood. Her parents, Bob and Karen Wood. Grace, Grace, Grace. Grace, Grace. That's her name, Grace, Grace. That's cute, Grace, Grace. Because of you. From the sermon? How about that? You know, I preached a sermon called Grace, Grace, and she named the baby Grace. Could, could you not have children or did? No. We just have a lot of mountains. Yeah. 
She is? That's awesome. Well, Lord, I thank you for grace, grace. I hold her up before you. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by your spirit. So bless her and keep her and use her and anoint her. And Father, we just pray for your favor like a shield around her. We just pray for her little steps to be ordered of the Lord all the days of her life. And keep her with your grace. And we thank you for it, Lord, and we praise you for it. Grace, grace, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand to our feet and give the Lord a great praise. Let's worship. Oh, good morning, Free Chapel. Did anybody come with a praise today? Come on, if you're ready to praise the Lord, can somebody lift up a mighty triumph and shout a
let's just lift up high the name of Jesus, the mighty name of Jesus, the powerful name, the beautiful name, the name above every name, Jesus. If you love him this morning, why don't you give him a big shout of praise, Jesus. We just want to welcome you this morning, and why don't you turn and greet two or three people, tell them how excited you are to see them today, and we'd also like to welcome everybody that is joining us online. We are so thrilled that you are with us and a part of this service today. Anybody excited to be in church this morning? Awesome. Well, if it's your first time with us today, we are just very honored that you have joined us, and we want to know that you're here. So if you would take the card and the seat back in front of you and fill that out, then you can take it to the Connections Lounge and you'll get a free gift. Or if it's easier, you can text HELLO1 to 313131 and we will meet you at our Connections Lounge with your gift and we would love to get to know you and tell you about some exciting things going on in our church. Now, if I've not met you, my name is Lance and I'm the children's pastor here at Free Chapel. And, and I'm just so excited to be here after the week that we have had. We have just had the most amazing week. Starting on Wednesday night, we made history together. We had our very first service in our new amphitheater and what a service we had, amazing. Pastor baptized over 50 people in our new baptismal pool, and it was just an amazing night. We celebrated forward with our Neon Festival, and Pastor Brock brought an incredible word. We had games and rides and just things for the whole family to be a part of, and it was truly a night to remember. I know I won't forget it, and it was just a wonderful thing to be a part of. Now, last week we also had our summer extreme camp for preschool all the way to sixth grade, and it is an unforgettable week. I, I can't tell you how awesome it is, but let me just say for just a moment that we, we want to thank every volunteer who took part in this. We had more kids than we've ever had before, and we had over 200 volunteers that gave their whole week, used vacation time. and spent time with your kids and we just thank all of them for the part that they played in impacting the next generation now we prepared a video for you to just show you a glimpse into summer extreme let's take a look <laughs> Come on, how many of you would like to be a kid again? I mean, I tell you what, it was the most amazing, amazing week. And, um, and I, I, just, I just know that God began a good work in every child that attended and everybody left there different. I know that, I know that I did. And as we prepare to give this morning, I have a verse that I'd like to share with you. And real quickly, it's Philippians 1, 6, and it says, and we're confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And this is Izzy Skinner here. She's an amazing young lady. We, we love her. She's been here all her life, and she's been coming to Summer Extreme since she was three years old. And she's in fourth grade now, and she told me that this year was different. This was her favorite year ever, and I'm going to let her tell you why. Well, hi, my name is Izzy, and I was in the Cyber Squad for fourth grade. And before I begin talking, I just want to give a round of applause to the Summer Extreme crew. This year has made a difference because I asked God into my life, and I have before, but I haven't had a purpose to. I've just done it because I've seen my friends do it. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. But this year I've matured and I've actually raised my hand when he called because I knew God had a plan for me. And I just said. And we're so proud of Izzy. And together we agree today that God who began a good work in you, even this morning as you're speaking to thousands of people, he will complete it till the day of Christ. We love you. Awesome. But let's pray this morning before the offering. Father, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for the gifts and we thank you for the giver. Bless today, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
Oh God, we sing to you today, God. We don't want anything that will separate us from your love. Oh. So let the church sing, for the Lord is good, we say. For the Lord is good and his love is good. Yes, the Lord is good forever. And I'll shout it from the mountain. Top. It sounds good, church. Can we lift it up? For the Lord. get healed just that quick sing with me how great is our God all will see how great how great is our God if you need healing just
just lift your hands and say how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Oh, I will see how great, how great. I tell you, the Lord is here today. Do you believe it? I want us to welcome our Gwinnett campus. They're joining us live. I want us to welcome our Buford campus. They're joining us live. Great. You know, what's happening down there is so great. And uh, I so appreciate the amazing volunteers at Buford. You guys have it made here in Gainesville. You just come in and flop down in a cushioned seat. But in Buford, they come in at about 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. They set up their sound system. They set up their children's department. They're in a high school. And they set up this and that. And every ministry, it takes about three or four hours to get everything ready to go. And there they are, a house full, hundreds there worshiping. Let's give God a praise for what he's doing. Good morning, Spartanburg. Good morning, Orange County. And good morning, all of you joining us live on the internet. We're so glad you're part of our online church. Turn around and shake three or four people's hands all around you. Smile at them and say, it feels good in here today. Tell them you look good too. Praise God. If you have your Bibles, open them with me to 2 Samuel chapter 10. Next Sunday is going to be phenomenal. Next Sunday is Father's Day. And we're going to celebrate our men around this place in a powerful way. It's going to be an unforgettable day. I'm going to get to preach. And uh, I believe it's just going to be awesome what I believe God's going to speak to us and do in this house on Father's Day. Bring your dad, invite your dad, and celebrate your dad. 2 Samuel chapter 10. It happened after this that the king of the people of Ammon died. And Hanan, his son, reigned in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent by the hand of his servants to comfort him concerning the death of his father. And David's servants came into the land of the people of Ammon. And the princes of the people of Ammon said to Hanan, their Lord, do you really think that David honors your father because he sent comforters to you? Has David not rather sent his servants 
to search the city, to spy it out, and to overthrow it. Then Hanan took David's servants, shaved off half their beards, cut off their garments in the middle at their buttocks. That's, a, that's, a, um, that's another word for rear end. I don't, know, I don't know how else to say it. Um, cut their garments off up to their, in the back, up to their rear end, exposing their rear end. I hope they had underwear on. <laughs> and sent them away. This is a funny story, seemingly. If you don't understand what's going on, I'll stop reading, but there is a real life lesson in this story that I want to try to give you today. Muhammad Ali got on an airplane and he was flying on a commercial flight somewhere and the stewardess noticed that he didn't have his seatbelt buckled. The world famous boxer who said that he was invincible. And the stewardess looked at him and said, Mr. Ali, please fasten your seatbelt. And he looked back and smiled and said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. To which she looked back at him and said, Superman don't need no airplane. Fasten your seatbelt. Nobody is Superman and no woman is Wonder Woman. We're all very vulnerable. We all have weaknesses. And I want to focus today on something all of us have a weakness in. Luke 17 and 1 is what the lesson is about. It is impossible that offenses will not come, but woe to him through whom they come. Jesus said it is impossible that offenses should not come to you. It's just impossible for you to live your life. You're going to be offended. Something someone is going to say is going to offend you. It's not possible to escape it. It's coming. It probably already has happened. And here's a news flash. It's going to happen again and again and again. There's no way out of it, Jesus said. It will happen. There's no one exempt. Nobody's Superman. Nobody's Wonder Woman. This one's going to get you. There's no way to avoid it. Somebody's going to shame you. Somebody's going to outrage you. Somebody's going to insult you. Somebody's going to humiliate you. You're going to get offended. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get angry. You're going to get violated. Didn't you come to church to hear this? You're going, your pride's going to be insulted. It is a biblical fact. Jesus himself said it is impossible for you to escape being offended in your lifetime. It's going to happen. And since it's impossible to escape it, you got to learn how to deal with it. Because not being offended is unachievable. It's not doable. There are no exemptions from it. It's going to happen to you. It's interesting that in New Zealand, only, there, only uh, a certain amount of the birds can fly. 41% of the birds in New Zealand are flightless the kiwi, the penguin, and on and on. They cannot fly. And here's the reason why. There are no predators on the island of New Zealand. They do not have snakes. They do not have wolves. They do not have uh, 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 bobcats. They don't have anything that would eat the birds. Therefore, if there are no predators, there's no need to fly. And when there's no need to fly, you lose eventually the ability to fly. If you go to New Zealand, and I've gone many times and preached, you'll see birds walking around everywhere, and they don't have wings. They have little knobs. They're, they've lost their wings through the generations because nothing ever, nothing ever opposed them. Nothing ever came against them. Nothing ever was a predator in their life. So it's a predator that creates the ability to fly. If you want to scratch around in the barnyard for the rest of your life, then just don't have any enemies and just don't have any problems and just don't go through any offense. But if you want to soar like an eagle, you can, but it's going to require some opposition. In other words, airplanes take off going into the wind. 
If you talk to any pilot, any pilot will tell you when they're taking off in an airplane, they want to know which direction the wind is blowing so that they can go into the wind because it's the wind that gives the airplane something called the lift. Without the wind opposing the wings of that plane, it won't get lift. And it's so important that we understand that 41% of the birds in New Zealand cannot fly because they have never had opposition. They've never had a predator. They've never had a problem. And you'll never mount up with wings as eagles until you go through attack and you go through persecution and you go through being offended. Opposition enables you to do things you could not do had you not had opposition coming against you. It's what gives you lift. It'll make you lift your prayer life. It'll make you lift. You'll run to God. You'll mount up with wings as eagles and fly to God. And if you'd have stayed, if, if you don't have the opposition, you'll stay right where you are. God intends for the winds of contrary opposition to take you higher. They'll make you fly to God. Now, what was taking place in this story in the Old Testament in, in 2 Samuel 10 is this. David was king of Israel. And he heard one of his old friends, King Nahash, had died. And he thought to himself, he's been kind to me. He was always kind to me. He was a good man. So I want to show some honor and be kind back to him. And I know his son is taking the throne. So as a gesture, like we would do here in America, if we heard the, you know, a president in some other nation had died, we out of respect would the president himself would go or he'd send his vice president or he'd send some high official to show condolences and to show and, and hopefully give some comfort and, and share and say we care enough to send representatives on behalf of America to grieve with your nation. Well, this is what David was trying to do. He was trying to show kindness. So he sent two of his mightiest men in his army to go to this foreign country, the children of Ammon, the Ammonites, their king had died and his son was taking the throne. And when they got there, someone had gotten into the king, the young prince's ear and said, do you really think that they're coming to show comfort to us, to show respect and honor to us? They're not coming for that. They're coming to kill they're coming to spy out the land. They're measuring the walls. They're trying to figure out. They're, they're like, they're, they're here spying this place out. They're getting intel that they're going to take back. And, t and they're noticing where our weaknesses are. And they're going to invade our city and take our city. And so the Bible said after they were falsely accused, because they were falsely accused, and they were not there for that reason. They had no evil intentions. They were there to show kindness from their king. Now, this is important. These men were sent by the king doing the king's will when somebody is about to offend them. You can be in the perfect will of God and do everything right, and you still can't escape being offended. They falsely accused them and the Bible said that this prince ordered that their, half of their beard be shaved off. And I'll explain how of a humiliating thing that was. And then that their skirt or their robe be cut off all the way in the back up to their buttocks to expose their rear ends. How humiliating. Half their beard cut off. I think it's funny whether you do or not. And, and they... <laughs> Do you want me to illustrate? And they cut, they cut off and they're showing the, it's like spank babies. I mean, these, these mighty men, for the mighty men, it probably would have been better had they beat them up or stabbed them or wounded them or cut them. But to go home like this, to go home totally humiliated, half of your beard is gone. And on top of that, your rear end is showing and you spank baby, go home and they're humiliated. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's, you talk about being offended. Uh, it wasn't a physical thing that was so bad. It was the emotional fact that they were, had been humiliated and offended. I'm not sure they would have got a lot of sympathy from other Bible characters. 
I doubt Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have been very sympathetic. We got thrown into the fiery furnace and all that happened to you is, is, is you got a little trim to your beard and, and you're showing all your underwear. Uh, that, that, that's, not, that's not persecution. You ought to go through what we went through. And, and maybe Daniel would have said, my goodness, you, that's nothing compared to what my enemies did to me. They threw me in the lion's den. But, but you're, they're going through it in, in, mentally, emotionally. The Bible said that they... They leave that place humiliated, the cutting off of the beard. The beard in Middle Eastern thinking, still to this day, was distinction and honor and maturity. Like in the Middle East, it, they were tampering. When he shaved half the beard off of these men, they were tampering with their rank, with their identity, with their pride. They sent them home like children, humiliated, who they were, a token of their authority had been cut off and now had cut off and now they're showing their part, back parts are exposed. How humiliating. And it all happened doing the king's business, doing exactly what they were told to do. If you live for God and you seek to do his will, you will find yourself wounded doing God's perfect will no one is exempt from it. If you get in a church like this, you will get wounded. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. Sing in the choir, you will get wounded. Usher, you will get wounded. Park cars, somebody's going to flip you a bird. You will get wounded. It's doing the will of God. It's somebody's going to roll their eyes. Somebody's going to talk about you. Welcome to life. I love this story because the Bible said as they were approaching coming back home, these mighty men, again, these were not weak men. These were not just little wimpy guys. They didn't even go prepared to fight. They probably would have fought, but they didn't even have their weapons with them. They were going on a peace journey, a, a comfort journey. And now they're coming home humiliated. They're looking at each other and about to come home to their hometown. And David hears what happened and he sends a man out and says, don't let them come into the town. I don't want them in the town circle to be humiliated and the other people and the other mighty men to see them. Tell them instead to go to Jericho. Now listen to this. Jericho means sweet fragrance. I want them to go over there to that sweet place and I want them to stay there and lodge there until their beard grows back. And we'll get, some, we'll get a seamstress down there and we'll get their, their rear ends covered up and everything's going to be fine. But I need them just to go to Jericho, the sweet place. Go to Jericho, listen to the instructions. When you get offended, here it is. I love the fact that he didn't let them come in and everybody see them in their shame. It reminds me of the prodigal son story when the father heard his prodigal son was coming home covered in, in the slop of the pig pen. He ran out with the robe, with the shoes, covered him, didn't want all those people to see him in his condition. I'm thankful we got that kind of king who doesn't want to humiliate us and doesn't want people to see our, 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 our shame. Just go to Jericho when somebody offends you, listen now, just go to Jericho and stay sweet. Your beard will grow back. Your beard, your respect will come back. Your honor will come back. Your authority, it's kind of, I know what they did was bad, but calm down, calm down. It'll all come back. It'll grow back. Don't get mad. Don't get angry. Don't seek vengeance. If you just stay sweet, everything's going to get better. It's going to work for your good. Just keep the right spirits. Go to Jericho, the sweet place, and stay sweet. Stay at Jericho till your beard comes back. I promise you, everything's going to be all right. It's so hard to stay sweet when we get offended. The natural person just wants to get in a shouting match, get in a fight. You cut my rear end and exposed it. I'm going to do something even worse to you. Here I go. And we want to go after and retaliate. And the king said, you go to Jericho. You stay sweet till your beard grows back. I think of Romans 14 right here. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. 
neither give place to wrath, for vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Two things God says are mine in the scriptures. The tithe is mine and vengeance is mine. And don't you touch either one. It belongs to God and God alone. And you need to understand that God doesn't take offense lightly. That what God was saying and what David said to these men, go to Jericho and stay sweet. When you get offended, if you won't render evil for evil, if you won't attack and give them as good as they gave you, if you will be quiet and go to the sweet place and just calm down, your beard's going to grow back. Turn to your neighbor and say, your beard's going to grow back. Tell a woman near you, your beard is going to grow back. I know they insulted you. I know they humiliated you, but all it is is words. You've been in a hussy over words. You've been all upset over words. Everything that, that you are, they may have insulted Salted it, but it doesn't change who you are. It's growing back already if you'll be quiet. And what about getting them back? Vengeance is mine. You stay in the sweet place, and you know what happens next? The Bible said in 2 Kings, or, or 2 Samuel, I think it's the seventh chapter, or the sixth chapter, it said that David told Joab to take some mighty men while they were in the sweet place. I'm telling you, God watches this stuff, folks. God watches when we get offended and he's, and he's saying, well, we're going to see if they're going to peck around in the barnyard for another 10 years and let them go around the wilderness again. Or we're going to see if they're going to have the right spirit this time. And if they'll stay sweet in Jericho and let their beard grow back, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn around and I, the Lord God, the King, will take out my vengeance. It won't be their vengeance. It'll be my vengeance. See, this is, this is something we don't understand. God is into vengeance. He even said in one place, it would be better for you to take cinder blocks with chains like the mafia does people and throw, them in, throw you into the ocean if you offend one of my little ones. Meaning one of the least ones in the kingdom, anybody who offends them, if they stay sweet, if they don't take out vengeance, if they don't do what, what, what they naturally want to do, but they trust me and say, God, that person really hurt me and it was unjust, but I put them in your hands. God said, you better know I take that offense so serious. Vengeance is mine. And I, I want to say this. Vengeance is a righteous act of God. He, nobody's going to get by with nothing. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you how holy vengeance is when it's placed in God's hands. Our job is to say when we're offended and somebody has truly done us wrong, Lord, I'm going to stay sweet. Help me to stay sweet. Please let my beard grow back. I've been insulted and hurt, but I'm going to stay right here. You got me covered back up. You're working on everything. I don't worry about my reputation, and I don't have to defend myself. I'm going to let you, Lord, deal with with that person, I put, I, put, I put their situation and their injustice in your hands, and I trust you, you're the God of vengeance. Now watch this. I think it's Revelation 21. The Bible said that in heaven, the martyrs were under the altar, and they were crying out. Those who had been unjustly killed were crying out, in heaven, avenge us of our blood. Now, if vengeance is wrong, that means sin is in heaven because there are, there are slain Christians in heaven whose blood comes up before the throne saying, avenge us. And God says, I will avenge. I will avenge. So the point is this. If you will stay sweet and you will go to Jericho and you'll stay calm and you won't cuss people out and you won't get throw fits and you won't go into rage, but you'll stay sweet. Let your beard grow back. God then, just like David, sent Joab and the army and the Bible said they wiped them out, folks. God's vengeance is greater than your vengeance. And God, when he, when he repays your enemies... He will do it in such a degree that you'll find yourself, this is true. I can think of situations like this where I've had, I don't always pass this test, but every once in a while I do. 
And when I do go to Jericho and just decided I won't do it, I'll shut up. The vengeance of God on a person can be so great that you'll find yourself saying, Lord, that's enough. Please, please, please. Your judgment is so, your vengeance is much more than what I would have put on that person. That's why in the Bible, Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them. This is the highest level. They know not what they do. That's why Stephen, when he was stoned and said, lay it not to their, when he was being stoned, lay it not to their charge. Because I'm saying to you today, God always repays. He is a God of vengeance. And all he's asking you to do is stay sweet and give the vengeance part to him. And quit talking about it. Quit being angry about it. Quit letting it obsess your life and let it go. Woe unto them that offend. Exodus 25 and 13 said that the Philistines, listen to this, the Philistines worked by revenge through old hatred. If you'll put that up, Exodus 25, 13. They they worked by revenge. That ain't it. (laughs) They worked by revenge through old hatred. That's a powerful statement. Through old hatred, they work by revenge with old hatred. Do you know how many families it's old hatred? Because they don't even know why they don't like each other and why their side of the family don't speak to that side of the family. It's old hatred. And the Philistines were always working by revenge out of old hatred for the Israelites. And I'm saying to you that if we don't watch it, our families can become like the Hatfields and the McCoys. That generation after generation after generation, there's this fighting stuff going on. And at some point, we need to go to Jericho. We need to shut up about it and let God deal with it and move on. And I want to close with this. I want to talk about unforgiveness for just a moment. When you, when, when you get in a place of offense and unforgiveness, it's like a tumor. It's like a tumor of unforgiveness. And you can act like you, you don't have it, but everywhere you go, everybody else sees it. You look like the hunchback of Notre Dame, but you're act, holding your Bible, praise the Lord. And when you get the tumor of unforgiveness, here's the reason why people say they can't forgive. I can't forgive and get rid of this. And you know, it's big and it's, it's, it's uncomfortable and it's sore. And sometimes when people touch that part of your life, you overreact because it's so sensitive and your children touched it and it wasn't what they did. It's that's been there and it's gotten infected. And every, every time somebody does something, you, you're fighting with your husband, but it's not about that argument. It's about that. They touch that. You're fighting with your children, but they touch that. And the reason that people say they can't get rid of the tumor of unforgiveness and offense, they say, number one, I can't forgive them because what they did to me is too big. (laughs) Well, it looks like that's why you'd want to get rid of it. The bigger it is, the bigger the thing you carry in your soul. This is what you've got going on if you could see yourself spiritually. And the bigger the offense, the more you need to get rid of it. Well, time will heal it. I'll just ignore it and it'll go away. You'll carry that the rest of your life. It ain't going to go away. You're not just going to wake up and it's going to fall off in the shower. It's going to be there. Well, I'll forgive when they ask me and say that they're sorry and tell me they're sorry. Then I'll forgive. Well, notice that they're at Six Flags and you're going around like this. And you're waiting on them to come ask you before you get rid of this that's in you? Last one. I'll forgive, 
And I would forgive, but I know what will happen. They'll just do it again. Well, that's a huge incentive to forgive. If they're going to do it again, that just means you're going to have another one over here. So why don't you go on and get rid of this one? And if they do it again, you'll get it again. But get rid of that one. You sure don't want four or five or six of these and somebody else. You got them in your knees and everywhere else. You need to go to Jericho. I conclude with this. 1993, Delta Force, United States Army in East Africa, a place called Somalia. It was the biggest gunfight since Vietnam. They were going in to nab a drug lord. And suddenly the Black Hawk helicopter that they were going in on was shot with a ground-to-air missile. Our soldiers were killed, many of them, and their bodies were dragged through the streets, the opposing army screaming and celebrating. They sent in a team to recover those bodies and the men that might have survived, and they became under tremendous fire. Hundreds and hundreds outnumbered, thousands outnumbered and gunfire coming, AK-47s from every direction. If you've seen the movie Black Hawk Down, this is the story I'm talking about. In the book, they tell about being pinned into a building and gunfire coming from every direction. And the soldier in charge, the captain, turns to a lieutenant and he says, get in the truck, we've got to get out of here, get in the truck and drive. And the response of the lieutenant is, but captain, I'm shot. And, and, and the, 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 the answer of the captain is a classic. He said, everybody's shot. Shut up, get in the truck, and drive. We're all wounded. We're all offended. We've all been shot. We've all had somebody do something to us. Shut up, meaning sh- don't whine. Don't complain. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. Enough victimization. Get over it. We're all bleeding. We all got bullet holes. We all have been wounded. Paul didn't get ahead. He lost his head. Shut up. Get in the car and drive. He said, none of these things move me. I'm more than a conqueror, and I don't give up. Job lost everything and everybody, and he said, I still praise the God who gives everything, and when he's given, I'll praise him, and when he's taken away, I'll praise him. So you just need to get in the truck and shut up whining and drive. Go on, move forward. You're going to be wounded. You're going to be wounded. The number one goal of the enemy is to get you mad at God. You're not the only one bleeding. You're not the only one that's been hit. You're not the only one that's got bullet holes in you. You're not the only one that your own family has attacked you and wounded you. But you can't lay down in self-pity and die. Get in the truck and drive. Acts 14. Exhort those to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. He's saying you're going to get there, but not without much tribulation. Offenses are going to come. It's impossible for you not to take gunfire. Don't get comfortable with your religion to where you think you are exempt from what I'm preaching. John 16, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. We're all shot. Shut up and drive. We don't quit. We don't draw back. Proverbs 24 and 10 says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. I love that verse. If you quit when the gunfire's coming, when everything's being hit all around you, that's when everything in us says, I give up, I quit, I'm done, I'm not, I'm, I'm, this is the end, fooey on this. But the Bible said that if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. 
Not, your, not the person who offended you, your strength. Paul Harvey talked about a man suing his own mom and dad because he was so ugly. His ground of suing them was if you couldn't do better than this, you shouldn't have had any kids. Always somebody else's fault. I can't stand those kind of people. Always, at some point, if you quit, your strength is small. Turn to your neighbor and say, shut up, get in the truck, and drive. Stay sweet. Go to Jericho. If you don't know where to go, I'll tell you where to drive that truck to. Go to Jericho. Stay sweet. Stay kind. People rip you off. People steal from you. People do you wrong. Don't get bitter. Don't get angry. Don't get hate-filled. Go to Jericho. Watch God if you'll stay sweet. Watch God. Watch him defend you. Watch him bring revenge, vengeance like you cannot imagine. When you do the right thing, the struggle is real, but so is the blessing. I want you to give God a great praise right now in your tribulation. Gunfire going off. Stand up on your feet. Lift up your hands at every campus. Lift them high right where you're standing. Come on, lift your voice. Don't get quiet. Raise your voice and say, God, I'm not quitting here. I'm not dying here. I'm not licking my wounds here. I'm not giving up. I realize that even the opposition is giving me lift. It's going to raise me up. It's going to cause me to go to a higher place. I'm going to mount up with wings as eagles. I couldn't get there without the opposition. Wow. It's the, it's the opposition that brings the revelation. I'm writing a book right now and almost finished Therese and I are. It's going, to be, it's, it's a big, going to be a big deal, I think, I hope. The publisher thinks so, so we'll see. But it's so funny that the very stuff that I'm writing on seems like that's what we're going through. And I know that I know that I know this, this kind of message is what we need. That the enemy wants you mad at God, mad at people, mad at others, and then ultimately to get you defeated enough to quit. But I'm not going to quit. And when I get to heaven, God will wipe every tear from my eye. But in this life, see, there's another revelation. We shout over that part. He'll wipe the tears. But in this life, you're going to cry over some things. But God one day will say, you remember that? Watch this. His hand will wipe every tear from our eyes. Wow. Now here's my altar call today at every campus. If you are carrying an offense, if somebody has done you wrong and you could justifiably lay out a case. <laughs> Remember the message I preached a few weeks ago about the ledger sheet? <laughs> you, you just, you, you, I mean, you have time, date, you got it all down, everything. My, my daughter Connor is sitting down here on the front row. Let me close with this. But it's great to have Connor with us. She's usually out in California. She's going to school out there and stuff. And, and uh, I called my daughters, called uh, Connor and Carissa the other day, a few weeks ago, and something was going on, and somebody, they were in a conflict, some very thing like I'm preaching, just, it was just wrong, it was just wrong, what was going on, they, it was just wrong. 
And so I started preaching my little sermon to him about Jesus said seven times on the phone. Jesus said, you got to forgive 70 times seven. I said, that's God's mathematical deal. It's not about keeping count. It's about, it's not about, what is it? It's not about, it's not about, uh, it's not about keeping score. It's about losing count. 70 times 70. And I, I, kept, I kept hammering that home. And boy, that when, I, when I first called them, that both of them at the same time. <laughs> By the time it was done, they were as calm. The presence of God came on the phone call. And they turned and said on the phone, you're right, you're right, you're right. I hate it when my children use sermons against me because here's what they did. They were in New York City when this happened. And they went. And, and they got some tiny little tattoos. And guess what it said? 70 times 7. They got the numbers right there, right there on their little arm. And they texted it back to me. And I said, tell your mother. And they blamed it on me. That's it. And so now me and Sharice have decided that we're going to join the 70 times 7 club. And I guess we're going to get one somewhere in that. And you're going to leave the church over that. Go right ahead. Whatever. I got you. I got you. I'll look at you. You're rear end as you're leaving. And I'll say 70 times 7. Churchified people, I tell you, they get on my nerves. That means something to me. I want to be reminded every time I'm done wrong, 70 times 7. 70 times 7. 70 times 7. Praise God. I run the spirit of religion out of here. I'm not interested in your stupid stuff. That's your conviction. Keep it. I would, I, I would never, I've never had a tattoo. I, I, you, you've heard Dale saying, you don't put bumper stickers on a Ferrari. Come on now. But, but I've never had one. I've never had one. But the Lord's, I believe, impressed me on that one. That's my personal conviction. You worry about you. And he said, you need to be reminded of this the rest of your life. That your call is 70 times 7. To forgive over and over and over and over again. And if you're here today and you would say, Pastor Jensen, I need to get free from an offense. Somebody's done me wrong. Maybe you've done somebody wrong. I'm sure you have. This is the altar call today. If you know this message is for you, get out of your seat and come stand down here right now. Come on. Come on. At every campus, don't hesitate, don't wait. Don't play holy games. Don't act like you got it all together. You know what you are? You know what you have? If, if you could see yourself, this is what you look like to God. Come on. Come on. Come on. No more games. No time to play games. No time to... We come to church. We put on our religious mask. We go through the same old services. And God's wanting to do something that can remove the tumor of offense and unforgiveness, but we sit in our pride and disobey. Today's your day. Come on, friend. At every campus, get out of that seat. Today is your day. Come on down. Come on down. This is awesome. Clap your hands, church. This is God at work. This is God at work. This is what it's all about. This is big stuff. If we can't get this right, Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love, not that you, what you wear, you don't wear, not have your rules. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another, that you love your enemies, that you do good to them. 70 times seven. Hallelujah. Raise your hands all over this room and let's pray this prayer together. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior right where you are at any of our campuses, pray this prayer out loud. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you that on the cross you forgave me of every offense. You took in your body my tumor of sin, 
a bitterness, of offense, and unforgiveness. And today, I receive your forgiveness. And I ask you now to remove every tumor of offense and unforgiveness. Take it out of me. I'm going to Jericho. I choose to go to that sweet place. Give me a sweet spirit. Give me a right spirit. Give me a Holy Spirit. Help me to be kind. Help me to be gentle. Help me to be chaste in my words. Help me to be careful with what I say. Set a watch over my lips. I release that person into your hands. I trust you to deal justly. And I release you, oh God. I release you to do what you do. Vengeance is yours, it's not mine. I give it up. Therefore, I have no reason to be angry with that person. I put it in your hands and I'll let your anger and your vengeance deal with it the way you see fit. You're a good God, you're a just God, and you know how to deal justly. So I put it in your hands. Come on, do it. I put it in your hands. Look at me just one moment. I want you to do something. I want you to reach in. This may seem silly, but it's not. And I want you to take that tumor of that situation, and I want you to put it in God's hands. And then I want you to throw your hands up and say, I'm free. I'm free in Jesus' name. Now go to praising Him just a minute. Go to thanking Him just a minute. Receive His healing. Receive His mercy. And give His healing. And give His mercy. Receive His forgiveness and give His forgiveness. Right now, be freed from it. Right now, be loose from it. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Now say this. Starting right now, reach up and touch your face. I feel a little stubby. My beard is growing back. God's gonna rebuild my name. God, any, any defamation I've gone through, any injustice that's come to my family name, God's gonna restore it. It's gonna be, it's gonna be better than before. So I'm gonna stay sweet. He's sewing up my garment. Everything's covered. Everything's covered. And in Jesus' name, I am free. Now, do you receive that today? Do you receive that today? If you do, a miracle happen. You're free. Say it one more time, I'm free. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you peace. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. We'll see you Wednesday night. We'll see you next Sunday, Father's Day. I get to preach. I hope you'll bring everybody you can. You're going to hear part two of this message, and I've saved the best for last. Don't miss next Sunday, Father's Day. Very, very powerful day. If you're visiting, I'd love to meet and greet you. I'm going to stay down here in the front, right at, down here on the main floor down here. And if you're visiting, I don't have anywhere to go or anything to do. Come down and say hello. We'd love to say hi. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. Go in the name of the Lord. We hope that you feel encouraged after hearing today's message. And listen, we want to hear from you. We want to pray with you and see God move in your life. So you can do one of two things. You can either submit your prayer request using the, using the online campus webpage, or you can do so uh, via social media, whether you follow us on Instagram or Facebook. You can submit your prayer request, and we want to pray with you and see God move in your life. But if you're asking yourself what's next after today's message, if you haven't done so already, sign up for SOD online. You can go to freechapel.com org forward slash sod online and you can sign up today and don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your faith with christ it's a four-phase discipleship program that i promise will change your life so again that's freechapel.org forward slash sod online but we love you so much we're thrilled that you join us here today at free chapel and we'll see you next sunday morning